Welcome to the Champs App Podcast, where we help players and parents demystify the world of minor hockey development and recruiting for both girls and boys. On this episode, I talk with Chelsea Walkland, who is the assistant coach with the Colgate University women's hockey team. We discuss her playing and coaching career at Robert Morris University, the importance of player skill development, and of course, the Colgate women's hockey program. I really enjoyed this conversation with Chelsea, and I hope you do too. Before we get to our guest, if you enjoyed this episode and want us to keep making more of them, please share it with teammates and friends. You can also subscribe, like, follow, and even better, it would be great if you would leave us a review. Now, let's drop the puck and get to the show. I'm very excited to have on this episode of the Champs App Podcast, Chelsea Walkland, who is an assistant coach with Colgate University. She's originally from Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, New York. She played four years at Robert Morris University. She then had various assistant coaching gigs at RIT, uh, which was a Division Three championship during the year that she was there, Oswego State, and then she went back to her alma mater at RMU for five years. And she is currently the, in her second year at Colgate as an assistant coach. Welcome to the podcast, Chelsea. Thanks so much for having me, Ray. Great to have you here. So as we do all our guests, it would be great to hear your hockey history, how you got into this great game. Yeah, so um, get started. I grew up, as you said, there in Pittsburgh, Rochester, New York. Um, grew up really playing a handful of different sports. Um, and I would say I was definitely on, on the later side of getting into hockey. Um, so I didn't start till I was uh, nine or 10 years old. Um, but what actually triggered it for me was um, the 1998 women's Olympic team. Um, the U.S. won gold over in Nagano there. So um, and we no, had like, Shelly Looney who scored the winning goal of the game on, on a recent podcast. So uh, yeah, yes, we, we went into detail about that, about that goal, but go ahead. Yeah. So I was kind of, I was part of that, you know, generation, like I would have been 10 at the time and um, just haven't been an athlete my whole life. Um, my dad was an athlete as well and uh, a big hockey fan. Um, our family grew up in, um, you know, when my dad was young, he grew up in Buffalo. So huge Sabres. Uh, fan there um, so just love the sport and uh, and yeah so I kind of talked with him um, asked him if I could give it a try and uh, sure enough in our town um, they started a girls all girls house league um, the Rochester Americans so um, that's kind of how I got into it how I got started had, you, had I, you got been skating before you were nine years old or was it the first time you went skating yeah. when you were nine yeah, I've, I'd been skating uh, a good amount, um, both roller, like they used to have like roller rinks in town as well, um, but roller and ice hockey, or sorry, um, ice skating as well. Um, so done quite a bit of skating. Um, my sister actually, she's three years younger than, than I am, but she um, had a little figure skating stint. So she was at the rink quite a bit um, and I'd be there as well too. Um, but but yeah, so, so got a little bit of a later start, but yeah. Uh, you know, just kind of ended up, honestly, just falling in love with it and, uh, you know, never looked back since. So, um, yeah, what started the, out. What were, what were some of the other sports that you were playing also uh, prior to, to hockey? Yeah, so soccer and uh, softball were my two main sports. I started those around like age four or five, um, kind of went went through that process. Um, I was a, a daycare kid growing up. And uh, so uh, we always kind of joke all, I'm actually still quite quite close with a lot of friends that I grew up with um but we would always joke that at daycare whatever sports season was in we played that outside and um you know just just kind of always playing something um always on the move um kind of doing that so so yeah um but then then got into it uh like I said Rochester Americans was um where I started in the house league and then um Rochester actually branched out into the Rochester Edge which is still a program today um, where they switched over, um, made a girls travel team. So got going with them. Um, and then uh, played a little bit with my, my boys high school team, um, which was uh, Rush Henrietta. So um, kind of kind of a flip side to, uh, to a lot of people's roots to hockey. It, I think at least with people I grew up with, they started playing with the boys, yep. then transitioned. And then for me, it wasn't until later on um, that I actually played hockey with the guys. So what was the difference? Be, what was the difference between playing with the girls versus the guys? Because obviously, uh, with 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 guys, there, there's more physical checking involved. Um, but also, just what's the overall dynamic like between playing with the girls versus the boys? 
Yeah, um, that's a great question. But uh, yeah, I think um, on the guy's side, obviously there's the physical aspect with full on checking being allowed. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, you say maybe average height, five, six ish around there. So I was probably say like middle of the pack to smaller side. Um, so just the physicality of it, um, you know, at that level um, and the speed of it, it's, it's pretty quick. So um, I think for me, it, it was, it was really nice to experience because it's, the game gives you feedback, like you're forced to keep your head up and, and to move pucks and, you know, kind of make plays there. And, um, you know, it's always funny. It's like, you know, the first couple of years you're in it, you're maybe around the same side, but then come like later in high school, those guys can, can get quite big and you're just hoping you don't get, uh, <laughs> you don't want one of them to fall on you. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah. And then, uh, so I think that's the on ice piece, you know, like obviously the physicality, um, it being a real high clip, real high pace. Um, but then, um, you know, I, I think going through my experience uh, playing both the boys and girls there, like to me, um, I fell in love with hockey there, and but I fell in love with everything about it. You know, like um, the time in the locker room with your teammates. I think you ask any retired player or anyone who's ever played the game, um, I, I think they'd say that the people were a big part of it. And, you know, probably some of their biggest memories. Um, I'm sure like some some hockey memories stand out, but uh, the biggest memories are, are the people and like those um, those times you have, like whether it be in the locker room and things like that. So, um, you know, from, I was fortunate to have that on my girls team and, and kind of have that camaraderie and everything. But then um, I'd say that was probably a challenge on the guys side where, you know, I'm playing for my high school, they're all in a locker room together and you're in a, a small little room you know, by yourself there. This um, wasn't a closet or a bathroom, so. Yeah, uh, it probably, it wasn't, but it was probably comparable in size to, okay. to a yeah. closet. Um, and uh, that's funny, actually, you bring that up because um, one of my my best buddies I grew up playing with, um, she went to Robert Morris as well. Um, we played four years together, but our two high school boys teams were playing each other, and uh, we were both actually sharing a locker room because it was the women's locker room so yeah. we're talking away like having a good time and then all of a sudden I get a, a knock on the door and it's a little um one of the grade nines from my high school team he's like hey like we're in warm-ups and we missed half warm-ups because oh, we're, <laughs> we're just hanging out like they forgot about us so um but yeah I, I'd say those are are quite the, the big differences gotcha and what do you think was the key to your development at that age was it um, playing with the boys? Was it great coaching? Was it you just had an inner drive? Was it you just uh, played so many sports? What was it that were the key to your, you know, being such a great hockey player? Yeah, I would, I would certainly say that uh, just kind of playing all different kinds of sports definitely gave me just like that foundation to, to kind of pick it up, you know, like I had a, a good um, foundation, um, fairly athletic. So um, I think that certainly helped, but, but um, I think a big piece of it was two part, like just having that joy for it and that love for it. Um, you know, I think if, if you have something like that, you're just passionate about, um, about getting better. And it's, it was a new challenge for me. Um, you know, having played different sports and, and having this new one, um, just kind of the process of it, just loving, trying to try something new and, and trying to find ways to get better. Gotcha. So uh, now let's talk about your transition into getting recruiting by Robert Morris University. Uh, how, did, how did that process take take place? Yeah, so um, well, it's funny. It, it wasn't that long ago, but, uh, you know, the recruiting process, it, it wasn't really much like it is today in terms of going, you know, super young. I committed to Robert Morris when I was um, in grade 12. Um that's late yeah. compared to these days. Yeah, certainly. And, um, you know, I had some some various opportunities and just like the different sports that I played as well, like just in terms of communicating with um, some other coaches and like soccer and and things like that. But um, again, like hockey was, was my passion and um, what I knew I kind of wanted to do. And um, I actually had a couple of injuries um, when I was growing up. I had knee surgery, meniscus surgery on both my left and right knee in, uh, yeah, grade 10 and 11. So um, maybe that slowed down the recruiting process a little bit for me too, but it was, it was quite the trend, you know, to, uh, to be a little bit later to make a decision. But 
um, you know, for me, uh, going through the process, um, I, I had some interest from a handful of uh, Division three schools and Division one. Um, and, you know, when I ultimately ended up, well, I guess I, I first, Robert Morris got on my radar because um, an assistant coach there, Jody Katz at the time, she was actually um, an assistant coach for, they call it the Empire State Games, which um, they do in New York, which is kind of like a little mini Olympic type tournament, um, if yep. you're familiar with that. But she coached me there. Um, so that's where I even heard of it for the first time. I never heard of Robert Morris, never been to Pittsburgh, anything like that. Um, and then my buddy that I told you the story about with the high school hockey, Mel Giambra, um, she was committed to go there as well. So there was a familiarity there for me. Um, but, you know, for me, when looking at um, what I wanted in the experience, um, everything just kind of checked out. Like they had, uh, they were in their, just their first year of their program when I committed. So I'd be a part of the second class ever, um, which was really appealing to me just the opportunity to, to help start a program up, um, the opportunity to maybe even um, play right off the bat was super appealing as well. Um, and then uh, from an academic standpoint, um, I ended up, I studied sport management. And so everything just kind of fit out there. And then um, when I went down for my visit, um, I think you, you probably hear a lot about it in the recruiting process, but everyone kind of talks about that, that gut feeling or um, that feeling of just knowing um, once you kind of find the right place. And I certainly had that when I went down to visit for the first time. Gotcha. And um, talk about your, the four seasons that you played at RMU. Um, just looking at your elite prospects uh, stats, uh, mm -hmm. looks like it was kind of up and down. Uh, you started off really well, then um, it's kind of a little zigzaggy. Maybe you can just talk about, uh, you know, what it was like actually playing as opposed to me just looking at a stat line. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, like I think when you, um, when you start a program, um, not only is, for one, the program kind of going through that process of growing and, you know, we certainly took our lumps early on, um, you know, from a program standpoint and, and had some really big wins as well that uh, I think kind of, you know, put the program on the map a little bit and, and kind of set things moving forward and then equating it or connecting it to my own play. Um, I feel like it, it'd probably be a part of that process and a part of that journey as well and, and learning about yourself and, um, you know, learning what it takes to compete at the Division One level and, um, yeah, just making sure that, uh, that your process is really good, um, you know, it, from a nutrition standpoint, from an, an off-ice standpoint, um, you know, there's a lot that goes into it, um, like your individual process as a, as a player as well, so... Um, yeah, I, I think that kind of all attributes to, you know, kind of the ups and downs as, as you alluded to there. Gotcha. And in your fourth year, uh, you had a new teammate come and join your team um, that uh, kind of played a big role in your personal life, uh, even today. Um, in, yeah. in, in the past, we had Sarah Reichenbach, who is a, uh, who coaches with her husband. So you want to talk about uh, the dynamics of, uh, uh, of, of your fourth year and, and meeting a freshman? Yeah, so um, <laughs> Kobe, De Kobe Delaney at the time, um, she's, she's my wife today, but, uh, you know, we got married um, a time after um, graduating, but it's funny you ask, like, when we played together, um, we weren't together, um, so, you know, that dynamic wasn't, you know, something that was there amongst, amongst our team or something that, uh, you know, um, we kind of went through, but that's where we, you know, in, initially met and met. And it wasn't uh, until after the fact that, uh, that we kind of got together. And, um, you know, now today we couldn't be more happy to, uh, to be with somebody that, you know, we, we share a lot of um, the same interests, obviously in hockey. Um, and, and we've got two young boys that, uh, that hockey names. So you want to tell them, want to tell folks their names? And yeah. I got, a, I got a question about their names, but go ahead. Yeah. They've got, uh, hockey names you could say, but obviously Kobina and Chelsea, they both start with a C. So kind of started out, we're like, oh, that'd be kind of cool to have, um, maybe a kid with the name with a, a C as the first name. And then, um, just kind of going through that naming process, we each like, threw out different names and we could not agree 
on, uh, you know, call it competitive, call it whatever it is, but we couldn't agree on one. And then, uh, yeah, we just, we came across the name Calder and um, we both, we threw it out there and uh, it stuck and we both loved it. So our oldest, who's three now, um, his name's Calder. So Calder is you know, the, uh, the, the trophy for rookie of the year in the NHL for folks who don't yeah, know. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And then, uh, and then Corson or Corsi we call him um is our our youngest he's one years old um but obviously the the statistic for for Corsi okay so um, it's not Shane Corson uh and no, his daughter whose well, daughter plays in, in in Boston uh it's not it's not not named after uh, Shane Corson. been asked that a lot but yeah. Uh, okay. but yeah that wasn't the first thought so. Uh, Corsi is the advanced stats uh analytics for you know how many shots for versus against uh, in a game so yeah. for folks who don't know what Corsi is, is all about so great yeah. all right so um after uh Robert Morris, you, you moved on. You, you, you stayed at Robert Morris as an operations manager, but then you started getting into coaching. So talk about your why you decided to get into coaching and, and that transition. Yeah, um, so I knew, I knew I always wanted to coach in some way, shape, or form, um, whether it be, you know, um, you know, I love sports, but uh, if, I, if I wasn't a coach, I'd probably go down the teaching route. Um, and my master's degree was in instructional leadership, which is more an education-based program. So um, I always like kind of pictured myself as like, maybe I'd be a teacher and then be a high school coach or something like that. Um, and then um, two, two kids that I grew up playing with, Nikki Skateri and uh, Ali Hills, um, both their parents, both their fathers actually um, were collegiate coaches. So um, growing up, I was... I was around college hockey. Um, I think that's something again that um, you know made me have goals of wanting to play college hockey. But you know, from from a fairly early age, uh, being exposed to the option of um, coaching as a career, um, I think something that that definitely at least put coaching on the radar um, at that level for me. But you know, after I um, graduated and was finished playing, um, it was between kind of going that maybe coaching route or um, I still had the itch to play like I started playing later and I still wanted to play but um, at that time 2010 is when I graduated and there wasn't um, you know women's pro leagues and so I started looking into um, to maybe going overseas and and maybe being able to play over there and then also have an experience to to travel as well but um, the head coach who I played for at Robert Morris um, he uh, kind of was talking to me about, you know, just kind of helping out and what directions next for you type thing. And then as you alluded to there, the hockey ops position um, came about. So it helped me just kind of get my foot in the door um, from a, from a standpoint in terms of job responsibility there. It's you're more so looking at um, equipment management, maintenance, um, helping out with some travel, but um, it got my foot in the door. I was able to go down to, uh, I know you've heard of the, the, um, college uh, hockey coaches convention down in Naples I was able to attend that and um, you know be around it meet other people and kind of network but that first year as, as a hockey ops um, it's funny like every every opportunity everywhere you hit up um, you take things along the way that that just help you prepare for that next thing and like so I knew how to skate sharpen skates I knew how to order equipment I knew how to do all these things that you know, in my near future would, would come really useful. So, um, that was it. And then, uh, and then after a year I did grad school, it was hockey ops. And then, uh, yeah, I, I got my first opportunity as a coach, um, back in my hometown at RIT, which was pretty cool. Yeah. And, and I mean, if you're only going to be there for one year, that was the one year to go, right? That's uh, right. Yeah. your three championships. So t tell us about that team and, and why you think it was so successful. Yeah, I I always say I was like fearful. I'm like, man, like you get right into it and uh, go win the national D3 national championship to be a part of that. I'm like, did it, don't want to peak too soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I was really just fortunate to uh, the timing worked out. Um, I was able to uh, to get back home around family and all that. But um, in terms of that team specifically, um, Scott McDonald was the coach at the time. Um, and he actually played college hockey at Niagara with Nate Handerhan, who was my head coach um, for all my years at Robert Morris. So it's funny, like from a um, hockey standpoint and that transition 
to being a coach, like there was a lot of similarities between the two um, in terms of just a lot of different things, whether it be like even drills in practice, um, how things were run and stuff like that. So like that transition was, was fairly smooth. Um, there's a lot of familiarities there. And then um, that team in particular, like, I think it was probably a, a bit of a whirlwind when I was in it my first year, like you're drinking out of a fire hose, just trying to take in, you know, as much information as you can. But I look back often at, um, at that group and kind of two things that stick out, one being um, the leadership that was on that group. Um, leadership is so important to, you know, maintaining a great culture um, and just kind of that lifeline or that connection between the coaching staff and the players that was was really strong and something I, I really learned and took a lot from and um, the other thing that I take from that team is um, they had lost in the national championship game the year prior so you talk about a team that's hungry mm -hmm. and making the most out of every day and and really kind of that's what got them up in the morning and drove them um, obviously I wasn't a part of that team team prior but you know they they returned a lot of the same players which um they had a lot of great players too that's probably another piece just having great recruits um in the mix there but they were hungry like they were really driven and I, I think that's something that I certainly took away from that group gotcha and then uh you moved on to Oswego State uh, tell us about making that transition yeah so uh, my position at uh at RIT um much like I think probably a lot of folks that you'd probably ask just kind of getting in the mix it was it was a full-time position but uh um really it was a, practically almost a volunteer position in terms of pay so I was fortunate enough my parents took me in for the year and they let me live at home with them for that first year ah, um, okay, gotcha. and then uh, and then Oswego they uh it was the first year that, that they'd had a full-time um, assistant position open so um, that was a little bit uh, of, of what drove that. So um, I actually, I was with RIT at the time too, but that, that opportunity came about and um, I moved there and the very next day was the first day of practice. So I think it was October, but I moved there. I got in, unpacked, you know, it's funny early on in, in uh, coaching, like all I moved around was a bed and some clothes, like just living with other people in the athletic department, things like that. So I moved in and then I think we had a 7 a.m. practice the next day. So it was just right into the fire. But um, but yeah, so I was at Oswego for two years, um, coached uh, with Diane Dillon, who was the head coach at the time there. And, um, you know, as a young coach, kind of like really still learning and getting into it. Um, I couldn't have asked for a better person to, um, to be under, like she, she puts, uh, the player experience at, at the forefront and she's like a life coach. Like she's, she's teaching hockey, but she's making sure that, um, you know, in all these other areas that her players are growing and developing. And I think she, from a, you know, me being under her wing standpoint, she, she did that with me as well. So it was nice. great. Nice. So, uh, and then you went back to your alma mater. So tell us about uh, how, how that happened and, and how, how those five years went at uh, RMU. Yeah. So it's funny. I like, I won't forget it. I was, um, it was in the summertime and I was visiting my parents at home and I was hanging out by the pool with my mom and um, I, I get my phone out and it starts ringing and uh, Paul Colantino, who is the current head coach at Robert Morris now, um, and was the coach at Robert Morris at the time. Um, his his name came across my screen, and and uh, I was pretty shocked. I was like, "Is this a, a pocket dial type thing?" Um, but I answered it, and uh, you know, he had just um, had a position open up on his staff, and um, so he basically just asked, "Are you ready to move back to Pittsburgh?" Um, I always kind of said, "If I had an opportunity to get back, um, I love the experience at school." Um, the city, everything, it was, it was phenomenal. So um, for me, that was a, a huge draw to be able to coach where you played at. And, uh, and then the other big piece of it was uh, Logan Biddle, who's the associate head coach there now. Um, he was the, the uh, other coach on staff and he played on the men's side while I was at school and actually married um, Brian McLaughlin uh, who played for the U.S. team um, in the Olympics for two years, but um, I played with her at Robert Morris. So 
we had that that connection and that feel to uh, to want to get back around um, you know people that were familiar. So um, again, I love my experience at Oswego. Like wasn't looking to leave. It was it was a great opportunity. It was close to home, but um, you know an opportunity like that comes and you know you don't get that that chance often. So jumped gotcha. on that. Gotcha. And over the course of the, the, the last several years, you've also helped out with uh, the USA Hockey, as you kind of just alluded to the, the Olympic team. Um, tell us about your experience with uh, helping out USA Hockey at the regional level and the national level. Yeah, so I've, I've been able to, uh, to be a part of it, as you mentioned, at the, at the regional level, just kind of helping out with, um, with district camps, particularly when I was in New York. Um, and then uh, in the summertime, you know, in July and St. Cloud, they always have those development camps. And yeah. um, my first experience with that was with the internship program. Um, Digit Murphy was was kind of the head coach um, running that program there. And and that's how I got in with the first camp there. And, and that was just an awesome experience. And probably honestly, one of the best things that I did for um you know, for my coaching career was you get in the mix, you're with all these, you know, the best coaches at the division one level, division three level, they're, they're all there and you're mingling with them, you know, like you're, you're right alongside learning from them. So um, that was a, a really great experience. And then, um, yeah, I just kept uh, applying to go back and, and be a part of that. And uh, I was fortunate enough to do so. And then um, as of late, uh, I was able to get invites to um, like the top 66, so one of the highest U18 camps that they had there. And then um, I was able to be at Lake Placid last summer, which is where they've got, um, you know, the, uh, the U18s and then they've got the older players as well, all in one group before they go off to play a mini series versus Canada. So um, that was an outstanding experience in itself. Like the U18s are there. Um, you know, co-mingling, like staying at the Olympic Training Center, but they're playing with kids on the Olympic, or they're hanging out with in the national team. Yeah, yeah, like Senior so they team. can. You've got that crossover, which I think just is invaluable for for the younger players to kind of see that and um, ask questions and and get in the mix there. So great. So I got I got, got a few USA Hockey questions for you then. So first of all, for folks who don't know, you were named to be an assistant coach for uh, the most recent under 18 team, which didn't end up uh, forming and, and competing due to, due to COVID mm -hmm. um, as an assistant coach to Katie LaChapelle, who's the uh, head coach at Holy Cross. Um, so are, are you uh, planning to be also the under 18 assistant coach? Do you know that yet? And then more specifically, what is it you're looking for, for players who, who would be on that team? Um, Cause obviously you've thought about that as you were preparing for, for uh, the 2020 session. Yeah, so I guess to answer your first question, I mean, I sure hope so <laughs> to be to be around um, moving forward. It was obviously um, real unfortunate that uh, that the games didn't happen there um, in Sweden, but there's a lot going on, um, as we all know, uh, during these times with COVID and everything. So um, the process that we went through, though, uh, as a staff with uh, Katie LaChapelle, Ali Altman, uh, Brianna Decker, and Mel Ruzzi, um, we had a lot of Zoom calls, which I think is, again, the theme of was kind of 2020, but um, just a lot of calls in terms of, um, you know, talking players, um, watching a ton of um, film in terms of getting evals on players and, and things like that. But it was, it was cool to be a part of that and to, uh, to be involved in that process. And then um, to answer your question in terms of, you know, what are you looking for? Um, you know, obviously you're looking for, um, for great players, like from a, a, a skating standpoint, um, a, a strength standpoint, physically strong, um, hockey IQ, like, are they able to make plays, um, all those things. But then uh, I'd say like, in addition to that, um, kind of two things like one again are they, are they passionate like there's a lot of players at that um at that elite level but the one that um is just kind of like so focused on on getting better like not just you know making um one of the camps and then just thinking they've arrived and they thinking they've made it but it's like that player that um is showing up 
to camp. They've got a notebook. They're taking everything in. They're um, they're just finding ways to to get better um, at everything they do. So I think um, those are kind of the, the things that stick out, you know, for what you're looking for. Gotcha. And what's the difference between, you know, a really good or a good college player and a national team player? Like what, what there, there, there's gotta be a gap. Um, so what, what, what takes a player from just being a good college player to being, you know, a, a really good national player? Yeah. And I think it, it's probably um, a little bit of what I alluded to there. Like, um, you know, the player that I think is, is passionate, um, is, is hungry, is maybe a rink rat, if you will. Um, they're, they're the person that's going to find joy in doing really hard things like hockey, you know, at the highest level, um, it, it can be a grind. It can be challenging. Um, there's a lot of, you know, the strength and conditioning piece that goes into it that, um, you know, if, if you're looking to, um, excel in really any area that you are um I think that passion is is really something that's gonna um separate you and then I think also um an understanding of what what your strengths are maybe what your weaknesses are too so you can bring your overall level up in terms of weaknesses but I think um you know with any team it's not all one player that one type of player that makes up a great team it's a lot of um different pieces so I think those elite players, it's them knowing what their strengths are and then, and then leveraging it and knowing, um, you know, what it takes for them to, to have success. And then just having that drive to get as good as they possibly can. Um, not, not kind of leveling out, uh, again, like the game's changing, it evolves, um, you know, being willing to, to be all in and, and pushing your levels, um, in terms of, you know, your strengths and what you bring to the table. All right, that's good to know. It really <laughs> gets, gets people thinking on, uh, on you know, do I, do I really want this or not? Because it, it'll show in, in how they play, I'm sure. So um, a couple of years ago, you uh, decided to uh, move over to Colgate. Um, they just came off a fantastic season where they lost, I believe it was in overtime, to, to Clarkson in, in, the, in the finals, in the NCAA uh, Frozen Four finals. So what, what made you uh, move over to, to Colgate after your years at RMU? Yeah, so, um, you know, I was at RMU for five years there, and um, we were able to have a lot of success, which was which was awesome. We won three regular season titles and, and a CHA championship. And um, kind of two-part, like for me, for one, um, in terms of, you know, my coaching career and in my development, uh, I, I want to just keep learning and, and keep growing. And, um, that was certainly something that was big for me. Um, the opportunity to, to go to a program, like you said, that, um, has had a lot of recent success, uh, you know, at the highest level, um, I'd gotten to know, um, coach Fargo and, and coach DeCoste through the, you know, kind of camp circuit and recruiting circuit, you get to know each other and, um, just had a lot of respect for what they do and what they did. And, and they're just great people and um, people that uh, that are always trying to get better and, and trying to learn new ways to do things. So, um, you know, from a, a career standpoint, that was something that I, I just want to keep learning and, and keep growing. Um, and then from a family standpoint, um, you know, my family's in Rochester, New York, still two hours away. And then Kobe's family, they're up in Ottawa. So um, getting much closer to them. Uh, especially with the little ones at home, we need all the help that we can we can possibly get being closer yeah. to family. So, nice. yeah. So, so um, did you think you were going to an Ivy League school? Because, like, I bet you a lot of people think that Colgate's actually an Ivy League school. I know it's considered like one of the little Ivies, and it's got a beautiful campus. But uh, you, yeah. know, you, you guys do have scholarships, so that basically says you're not really an Ivy League school. So, do yeah, do you get a bit right. of that. Um, so, so having grown up just two hours on the road, I was familiar with Colgate and I, I knew they weren't an Ivy, but I've, I've certainly heard that, um, quite a bit before, uh, the, the academics, um, you know, at Colgate are, are second to none. Um, it's, it's a really tough school to, uh, to get into and, um, it really challenges, you know, you know, students, um, once they, they get there, but as you alluded to there, um, it is not an Ivy and, uh, and we do have scholarships. So 
Great, great. Yeah. And um, since uh, Greg Fargo, who's the head coach, came in, I mean, he's really had a vision for how he wanted to, to lead the program and where it's come from. Um, and I know he uh, uses, you guys use lots of slogans in your locker room, uh, the expression, we play free. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's a great video of him giving a tour of the facilities recently of, uh, of everything and, and the logos in the locker room and on the walls here and there around the, uh, the facilities. Maybe you could just talk about we play free and what that means. Because I think that that's a theme that runs through the type of players you look for and the way you run the program. Yeah, it's uh, it certainly is. Like you look on on Twitter, online, everything like that, you'll probably see uh, we play free when you come across Colgate hockey. But yeah, it's something that uh, that Greg Fargo um, kind of developed and, and introduced, and it's really just the notion of um, you know when creating an environment in which um, players have the opportunity to, to be themselves and to be their, their best selves. And, you know, if you create an environment that, um, that promotes growth and, and allows for mistakes to be made, um, you know, that's when you're going to kind of push through your comfort zone. So that's really kind of, kind of the notion of, um, you know, it's, it's not, uh, we play free in a sense that everyone's on their own page, just kind of doing their own thing. There's certainly, um, some guiding principles in terms of what we do, but, um, you know, wanting to, uh, to have the puck, make, possess the puck, make plays. Um, but, you know, I think, I think a, a large part of what, you know, makes, makes a good player, you know, showcase what they can do or a great team showcase what they can do. It's, it's doing all the things within your principles and in your systems, but it's like, what's that extra, whether it's um, creativity or special juice, like what else extra do you bring to that table? So um, something that it'll, it's an opportunity where it allows for um, players to, to kind of have that creativity and, and go for it. Yeah, a couple of the other slogans that you guys use are no limits and team first. So it seems like that you have a way to kind of unleash that creativity, but yes, keep it within the team environment. So um, how do you, how do you divide responsibilities amongst the coaching staff? Yeah. So um, for this year, for us, um, we've got, uh, I'm in charge of uh, the penalty kill primarily. Um, I work with the forwards and then uh, I, I oversee the face-offs for a program um, and then Greg and Steph, they, they each have a unit of uh, the power play. Um, Steph works primarily with the D and then Greg's kind of got his hands, um, you know, in with everyone type thing. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's kind of generally how it's broken down. Um, but I'd say from a, from a staff collaboration standpoint, there's, there's a ton of crossover, um, but with those being the main focus, but there's a ton of crossover. Um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page and just bouncing ideas off each other to uh, to try and get the best product. And who works with, with the goalies? Uh, Greg, sorry, okay. I I can't forget about the goalies. Um, <laughs> Greg, he was uh, he was a goalie himself. Um, last year we had Chris Cobb with us. He was our volunteer assistant, so um, he worked primarily with the goalies. But then um, once he left, Greg Greg picked that up. So gotcha. And and what's your demeanor like during a game uh, behind the bench? Uh, you know, are, are you you're vibrant and, and effusive or are you kind of mild mannered and, uh, you know, yeah. uh, just let the players play? Yeah, I'd like to say mild mannered, but uh, I try and be, I try and be Zen. Like I try not to get too caught up in uh, maybe calls that are made and, and things like that. Um, I really think that your players feed off of you and um, you're kind of a, a reflection of, of how the game's going. If, if we're complaining the whole time or losing our minds to me that that has ripple effects through the team. And, um, so try and try and be as calm as possible. Um, really you try, I think your best as a coach to, um, prepare throughout the week and, and really be dialed and, um, dedicated in terms of what you want to teach, what kind of mindset you want heading into the game. So, um, you know, I know myself as a player, um, when it comes game time, you just, you want a kind of a clear mind. You want to just be able to go out and do your thing. So in all honesty, I try and uh, just be really dialed throughout the week and then let the players have their game on um, in game and, and certainly point out things maybe here and there that, I, that I'm seeing, but um, try and just bring a lot of uh, a positivity and 
um, encouragement and really just kind of let them do their thing um, and, and just trying to get in their way, really. Gotcha, gotcha. And uh, this past weekend, one of your players, uh, Danielle Serdakny, she uh, scored a couple of goals this weekend, I believe. And um, her dad is actually a pretty well-known hockey skills coach. Uh, I used to watch his videos about 15 years ago from Hockey Canada. And you also have a new recruit coming in from, uh, uh, who's the daughter of a previous guest on the show, Daryl Belfry. So I'm assuming you don't have to have a parent who's a skills coach in order to play at Colgate. Um, but obviously skills development is pretty important. Um, I'm wondering how, you know, you think about uh, individuals skill development and uh, maybe have one of these parents come on uh you know one, one of these these high-end skills guys uh coaches uh come onto the ice and yeah, help out once it, in a while it's uh it's funny how you bring that up because i just think um i think the support system that that players have and um the culture in which they grow up you know amongst their family like what an invaluable tool to have you know somebody of that mindset or that uh that you know experience level to be sitting across from you at your dinner table it's just it's an invaluable piece and and something I certainly hope that uh if our our two boys get into that uh that they can just have a love for the game and enjoy being around it and sharing that bond but uh um you know from from what you say like they don't have to to have a, a skills coach um but uh Sorry, I, I lost the second half of the question. What was it? Um, so how, how do you trade off, uh, we'll get into just development, what, what, what you do for individual oh, development, oh, yeah. and then how, how do you trade off, uh, you know, individual development versus team winning? You know, do you ever sit your yeah. freshman and say, like, we, we got to win this game. Uh, sorry, you're not going to get this ice time. Yeah, so, okay, so from a, yeah, from a development standpoint, um, you know, I think through the recruiting process, you're just, you're looking at, you're looking for kids that, you uh, that want to excel in, in all levels, really. Um, and then from a, a standpoint, you want to just create that, an environment of competitive excellence. You want like-minded people that are, are looking to grow and develop. And um, I think development, uh, it can, you know, a lot of people talk about it, but uh, I think from um, having kind of a game plan for it, you want to make sure that um, you know your players individually, um, again, talking what their strengths are, and then how can you leverage those strengths um, from an individual basis. And then I think from a teaching standpoint, um, I think as coaches, you know, we're all teachers at, at the roots. Um, so I think um, it's our responsibility to, um, to really like, have that understanding about what individually our players need. And then also as a collective unit, um, you know, within that framework, like what's going to make us successful. So um, almost as a teacher would a lesson plan, um, you know, we, we have quite extensive talks, you know, in terms of what goes into to practice planning, um, talks about players, discussions, you know, where are they at, who needs a touch this week, who needs to, uh, to have an individual meeting type thing. Um, but uh, I think it's all those things combined that, um, you know, there's a dedicated effort in, in trying to make to bring each of our players up to that next level so that the whole, you know, collectively um, benefits from that. Got it. Great. All right. So now let's uh, move into the recruiting side of things. So obviously COVID is, is kind of thrown a curveball into everything that's going on, especially with the blackout period pushed back again now until, till probably June. Um, t tell, tell us about what, how you see recruiting happening over the next, over the summer and, and into the fall. And in particular, uh, you know, what advice do you have for, for, you know, players who, who either haven't been on the ice or haven't been scouted only maybe by video, uh, especially if they're 2022s or 2023s. Yeah, I, it's, it's going to be wild. And I think it's going to be so different program to program um, in terms of, you know, what they need. Um, just kind of how things transpires. Like, again, you've got programs that haven't even played this year. So how's that going to look? Are they going to, you know, just push everyone back a year? Um, I think it's, it's going to be drastically different. And I think you'll have the ripple effect of that for the next couple of years, just really seeing kind of how it all plays out type thing. Um, you know, from a, a standpoint in terms of um, maybe like advice for, for people that are looking to be recruited, um, I think COVID was, you know, it's, 
it was not your normal year in terms of playing. And, you know, a lot of people are not even on the ice type thing, but, um, you know, seeing that adversity and seeing that as, as kind of an opportunity, I think it's, it's a time period where, um, that you can make gains, whether it be some off ice stuff, like you always talk about the physical fitness side of the game, you know, if that's a variable that you can, you can eliminate or you can check off, like being fit, um, working on skills, watching the game, um, you know, the, you know, the women's, the women's game at the professional level, they're starting to be games online, NHL is playing. So I think the more you can just be dialed at trying to find any little edge or any advantage you can to get better, um, the better. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, from that aspect, like once things kind of start to play out, um, you know, I think deep down, like you've earned that confidence in the sense that you've, you've made the most of every day and you're, you're in a spot that, uh, um, gives you the best opportunity, um, to maybe, to maybe get recruited or maybe have jumped over some other players that didn't take advantage of that time. So. Gotcha. And what activities do you have planned, uh, assuming the, uh, the, the blackout period ends in, uh, in June? I know historically, um, you know, Coach Fargo's had uh, Ryan Camps out of Colgate, which you participated in. Um, what 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 activities are you going to be doing to to kick off the recruiting process? And and you know, how could folks uh, you know be where you guys might be looking? Yeah, um, Colgate's done quite a few camps in the last little bit, as you alluded to with uh, with Greg, um, getting those going. That is something that's on our radar and something that we would hope to have, um, whether it be mid to late June, July. Um, or maybe even early August, but uh, at this point, um, we haven't gotten a go-ahead, or um, there's there's no kind of light at the end of the tunnel there, so to speak. So um, I think it's something to to maybe keep on the radar, um, and and obviously it'll certainly get information out um, regarding. Hit refresh on the uh, the Colgate camp page, you know, every uh, every couple of days to see if there's yeah, some that's new right. information. Yeah, okay, that's right. Um, but so looking out for that, and then uh, and then really, I think for for us, um, there's a lot of, you know, June is typically when things kind of gear back up for us in a regular year. And there's a lot of um, camps like U.S. development camps as well, um, early in, or early into the, the next season as well with, um, you know, various camps that are, are typically held. But uh, um, yeah, so I, I think as soon as those things start happening, um, we're obviously itching to get out. Um, we miss being out on the road. We miss, you know, seeing everyone play live. But uh, I will say too, um, on the flip side of things, like it makes you wonder as as with everything, as things evolve, um, the amount of, of online recruiting opportunity. Um, it's something that certainly I think you're seeing a lot of coaches try and take advantage of um, because we can't be everywhere. But um, yeah, we're, we're excited to get back out on the road, but um, I think that online piece is, is a big piece as well. Right. Um, and, and, and so related to that is how, how can, you know, uh, players raise their hand and, and get on your radar, uh, you know, via digital means these days? Uh, obviously, you, have, you must have a questionnaire on your, uh, on your team website. What, what other ways are the best way to, to kind of get on your radar? Yeah, I, th I think questionnaire, that's a huge piece. Um, probably most any programs have something like that, but it's a way in which programs can one, identify people that are interested in your program, but also to at the same time provide contact information, things like that. Um, a lot of uh, recruits and players have, have gotten pretty creative. Like you can send an email to us at any point in time, but based on um, NCAA age guidelines and things like that, um, we may or may not be able to respond. But I think, um, you know, being proactive on that side of things and um, you've seen kind of a, a lot of uh, unique ways in which people are, um, you know, sending out emails and things like that, whether it be like creative little highlight videos, something that catches your attention, maybe a little bit different from the, the pre previous email type thing. So um, I think that's certainly an avenue to continue to, to just get your name out in front of coaches as well. Right. And how can folks, um, you know, find you guys on social media or online, uh, you know, the team website, Twitter, Instagram, what, what, what's the best way to, to kind of follow the program? Yeah, I think uh, all our staff information's on the, uh, the website there, um, as well as our, our team social media presence is going to be on there too, in terms of handles, stuff like that. 
um, a quick Google search, I think, will will probably pop up all of our our social um, our social uh, handles and things like that too. So, um, yeah, just kind of a either through the team website or a little Google search. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, Chelsea, I want to thank you so much for coming on the Champs App Podcast. This is great. It's really interesting to learn about the Colgate program and your coaching background. So thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Ray. And, and thanks for what you're doing for, you know, women's hockey and um, in the sport. I think it's been awesome. I really want to thank Chelsea for coming on the podcast. It was great to learn more about the Colgate hockey program and her coaching journey from Division Three to Division One. And remember, if you got something out of today's episode, we'd really appreciate it if you'd like, follow, subscribe, and even better, if you could leave us a review so we can keep sharing this important hockey information with folks just like you.